It's really good to see you all here. This is something that I feel passionate about and I'm excited to share about today. And maybe just share a few thoughts that, you know, we haven't really heard very much about in state government for a while. And I want to begin with just kind of laying out where we are in today's culture. Would you all agree that our culture has grown quite dishonoring? Yes. Would you say? When you, when you look at when you, like our political leaders, we have men and women running for president who are actually in the news fighting about each other's spouses. I mean, you know, and then you've got, you know, if, if you win an election, you're accused instantly of stealing it, you know, even if you totally did it the right way. And don't even get me started on other drivers, <laughs> right? Now, not, not you and me, but I'm talking about the other drivers, right? You know, I mean, they're, oh my gosh, the dishonor, you know, just, it's, it's gotten so bad. So is it any wonder that this dishonor and disrespect in a lot of ways has spilled over into our workplaces? Despite all this, I want to make something very clear for us here in Frankfurt today. Together, we can change the culture of our workplaces. We can do this and we, if we do it together. And I remember, um, I, I just rewatched The Sound of Music um, a couple weeks ago. Do you all remember that scene where Captain Von Trapp comes back and Maria's got the kids all singing, you know, and stuff, and he, he, he hears them and he's like, what, what's that? And he goes in. Remember, he's been so hard and angry, but the music, as he hears his children singing, begins to warm his heart. And there's this great conversation that he has with Maria after he, like, hugs his kids, and it's like the first time in a while, you know. And he runs out and he catches her, and, and they have this great conversation at the stairwell. And he says to her, you brought music back into the house. I had forgotten. And my friends, American culture has forgotten how to be honoring. We've just reached the place where, for a lot of different reasons, we, we've forgotten how to show respect to people, whether they deserve it or not. And so I want to talk a little bit about a culture of honor. Now, at its core, when I say a culture of honor, I mean um, just basically choosing to regard or treat others with respect and admiration and gratitude. Now, here's an interesting uh, subtlety that I had never picked up on until I heard a friend of mine talking about this a few years ago. Respect is earned, right? Oh, well, he has to earn my respect. But my friends, honor is chosen. We give it. We choose to give honor to people. And so there's a crucial difference right there in a culture of honor. We decide we're going to show honor to those who are around us and then above us. And this choice is crucial. We choose to value people for who they are, and then also to show gratitude for the work that they do. This is something that's sorely lacking. Uh, I heard that Harvard Business did a study last year, and they looked at over 10,000 American workers. And do you know what 93% of them said? I feel undervalued and underappreciated at work. I mean, 93%. So almost everybody you talk to feels like they're not noticed. Like Captain Von Trapp, we've forgotten. We have forgotten some of these basic things, and we've even forgotten some of the people who are sitting right next to us. We've forgotten to look around us. Now, what is the opposite then? If a culture of honor is choosing to give respect and looking for ways to show gratitude and tell people that they matter, then what's the opposite of that? And it's entitlement. A culture of entitlement. Um, is it any wonder that we have an entitlement crisis in our federal budget? Have you ever thought about that? The three main programs, right, Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, are driving two-thirds of the federal budget. So we have an entitlement crisis, and it's a perfect uh, analogy for where we are culturally as well. Now, my friends, I know entitlement. I've been a professor for eight years, and I've got these millennials. I mean, you know, what, you, know, you know, what am I going to say to my kids? I didn't get a cell phone until I was 18. You know, like, what, they are so, the, the entitlement level is off the charts. And I say that coming from, I'm, I, I'm actually right after Gen X, so I've never figured out if I'm Gen Y or, you know, just so, you know, what, like somewhere in between. But I thought my generation was entitled. And I look at these millennials and We've done so well. You know, we've been blessed to do well economically, and we have this technology. 
And they've pretty much gotten whatever they wanted. And we're all suffering from that too. And so we feel entitled. Now, what do I mean by entitled? Entitlement is I deserve this. So right away, it's not any, there's no choice or I'm not choosing. I did this, so I deserve to have you thank me for this, for the job that I'm doing. And here's the thing. We should thank people, but actually, the way it works, like legally, all we have to do is pay you. That's it. We don't have to do anything, you know, and we don't pay enough, as we all know. Okay. All right. There's no real gratitude or appreciation in an entitlement culture. Because if I'm expecting you all to give me what I deserve and you hit that, then there's nowhere to go above that, right? Because automatically, I, there's, there's no way to bring true appreciation or gratitude. You're expected to do these things because you have to, not appreciated because you choose to. So that's why, my friends, honor kills entitlement. The choosing that comes from honor kills the deserving, or if you will, the expecting, that comes from a culture of entitlement. Now, I have a warning here about a culture of honor. If we were going to try to work to bring this here at KYTC or across state government, it only works if it's genuine and intentional. If I go to honor you for what you did, but you know that I'm, you know, you've been mad at me and I'm just trying to suck up to you or, you know, whatever, that's manipulation, right? I'm, I'm manipulating you. So if we're going to do a culture of honor where we're choosing to show admiration and gratitude, I'm actually, it has to be from the heart that I genuinely want to, to, uh, to tell you what a good job you're doing and let you know uh, that it matters. And then I mentioned intentionality because it's easy to forget this in the busyness of our lives. I, have you all ever had this? It, it happened to me again yesterday. I was sitting there and I came out of my office for air and uh, I was like, it's two o'clock? You know, like, how did it get to be two o'clock? You know, we're so busy that we forget. And so my friends, uh, in a culture of honor, usually it takes intentionality to make sure that we're showing honor to people. Being intentional doesn't make it any less genuine. In fact, when you show something intentionally, it actually shows this was so important to him that he wanted to come over and tell me this, even if he had to plan it or make a little room for it. I just, I share that you all about genuine intentional because sometimes we think if it's intentional, it's not as genuine and it totally is or it can be. So be genuine, intentional and choose honor. All right. Why should we choose honor, right? Okay, so you've talked about our culture and kind of like what a culture of honor would look like and, you know, why should we do that? Well, first of all, everyone wins in a culture of honor. It's more joyful. There's a greater sense of appreciation, accomplishment, and belonging. You all, I love uh, the, the founder and CEO of Ritz-Carlton. His name is Horst Schulze. And if you can't tell already, he's German. And uh, Horst says that loyalty, loyalty begins the moment that you realize that that person cares about you. And so when we show this type of honor to people, they begin to care. They begin to feel loyal to us and our team and what we're doing. In such a dishonoring culture, when we choose to show honor, it actually disarms people, right? They've, they're not used to that. I went down to the post office the other day and uh, there were four people in front of me and uh, by the time the, the uh, older lady who was talking about the price of stamps and what they had been since Eisenhower, uh, you know, <laughs> when she got done, there were five people behind me. And, and the thing is, I was really frustrated because I was actually late to get here because I'm from Campbellsville and it was at the Campbellsville post office. And, and I made a decision. I said, okay, this postal worker is doing her best. It's only her out here. There's, there's like uh, nine of us now. I'm going to do my best to honor her even if she's rude or gets frustrated. And it's amazing how I watched her disarm as I just smiled and I listened. And she actually gave me some pushback from what I was asking, but by the end, it was good. It disarms people. It encourages them. And, and so you will, with that, that point on everybody wins, why should you do it? Well, okay, if it's genuine and intentional and you're doing it for the right reason, you can also be aware of this fact, that honor publicly 
results in influence privately. Do y'all follow me on that? Like, as you show honor to people, you begin to gain influence with them because they know that you care about them. Again, if I'm manipulating you, then I'm not going to get any influence because, gosh, he's such a faker. And I was a theater uh, minor. I don't know if you can tell, but all right, anyway. Uh, no songs today yet. Uh, yeah, that's, yeah, that's what I see. <laughs> so, like, when we show honor publicly to people, when we're with them in a meeting, or later, they, we've, we're growing that influence. We're showing them that they matter, and then they begin to care more about what we think and what we're doing. So, again, everybody wins in a culture of honor. Why should we choose honor? The second one, and you all, this is one of the, my biggest points for us today, for you as ALA leaders. Everyone takes their cues from the senior leader. As just the way we're built, we're always comparing. Some of you have noticed my tie. It says LWC on it for Lindsay Wilson College. I got 1985. You know, some of you maybe noticed my hair or my shoes or you were looking at Allison and what she's wearing or you know, the guy in front of you who obviously didn't shower. You know, like, you know, whatever. We're constantly comparing everywhere. So my friends, everyone takes their cues from the senior leader. Are you the boss in your area? Everyone is looking to you. They're seeing how you lead, how you go about these things. And, uh, and so let me, let me just ask you all, raise your hand if at some point in your career you've had a bad boss. Okay, look around, pretty much everybody. All right, raise your hand if your boss is bad now. No, I'm kidding, don't, <laughs> I'm just like. <laughs> Uh, you know what the good thing about a bad boss is? Didn't you walk away going, well, I know what I'm not going to do if I'm ever in that spot. And, uh, I, you know, I was here under the previous, under Governor Fletcher, like a lot of you. I know some ways I would not help lead this cabinet, you know, <laughs> because of some of the people that were here before. I'm not judging them, just saying there's some mistakes that were made, and we've learned from those. Everyone takes their cues from the senior leader. So you as a leader need to be very aware, grow in self-awareness in that, uh, because your team is looking to you uh, as you lead out, and they're comparing and thinking, you know, you know, what could I do? They're learning from you. My last point on this question of why should we have a culture of honor is equally as important as the previous point. Good leaders know how to follow. There's a, if, if, if you all don't mind, I'm going to use a story from the Old Testament in the Bible. And I love this story because in it, so the Exodus, right? And the, the, the uh, Hebrews have left Egypt and they're wandering the desert and now they've entered into uh, what today is Israel. And uh, God tells, in the story, God tells Moses that they're going to go to battle. And he tells them, and some of them might remember this story. He says, if you hold your arms in the air over the battle, we'll win. But Moses, when your arms go down, we're going to lose. And so Moses is standing there, and as you all know, unless you like to wave permanently a lot at people, your arms start to get tired, right? And Moses' arms get tired. And guess what happens? They begin to lose. So his arms go back up. And finally what happens is his brother Aaron and then a man named Hur come alongside him, and they give him a place to sit, and then they hold his arms up, one on each side. And the Israelites win the battle. And my friends, here's what I love about this. Aaron was the leader of the Levites, like the priesthood in the, the Hebrew nation. He was a leader in his own right. I mean, he, like he could be number one. But for right now, he was number two. And because good leaders know how to follow, he comes under Moses and he holds his arm up. And, if, and so, my friends, like for us to be good leaders, we have to know how to follow. And, uh, and so we come under, look for ways to come under the leader that you're under authority right now and hold his or her arm up. Because one day that's going to be you, and you're going to want them, your people, to do the same, right? All right, so uh, how do we create a culture of honor? And then I have a couple last thoughts, and we're going to finish. It's very simple. Be the leader that others want to follow, Right? I really don't have a lot of deep thoughts on this one. You know, show gratitude and appreciation. Encourage those you work with. You know, my, my fourth grade PE teacher, Mrs. Greider, 
had the golden rule on her door. This is before everything was illegal, you know what I mean? Like in our culture, like every other thing is illegal. Uh, and uh, she had the golden rule on her door, which actually as a fourth grader, I remember being like, so is like in dodgeball, do we golden rule, dodgeball? That doesn't really work for me. And I'm not athletic, if you can tell, like I'm not the biggest sports guy. But I remember I would read that and I would think about just, um, how do we want to be treated? Let's do that for others. It's, it's, not, it's not very complicated. I think like Captain Von Trapp, we've also forgotten some, in very, some very important words. I'm sorry. Or thank you. Or hey, I see you. And I really appreciate what you did there. I think bringing those back you know, would, would go a long way towards a culture of honor. A little humility perfectly supports uh, cult, this kind of culture change. I would encourage all of us to honor others every time. You know, honor tries to believe the best. It, you know, it can expect that we're going to mess up and there's grace for that, but, you know, that in a culture of honor, you know, I'm, I'm going to believe the best and until I hear the story. Let me wait and, you know, you hear about something. Uh, the secretary and I get this a lot upstairs. We get a phone call and it's the next thing that just blew up in the last hour and we're hearing about it. And one of the things that, you know, I, I try to do is think, okay, I'm not going to overreact. And I'm going to wait until I hear from the person that's there, right? Like, I'm going to believe the best, and then, uh, and, and, that, and, that, and, by, and that honors them, right? Um, versus devaluing them by dishonoring them. So, oh, by the way, in honoring others every time, like choosing that, sometimes that means not saying anything. And that's okay. Because uh, I'm Scottish. We're kind of famous for flaring up, you know? Some of you are Scottish. And sometimes I need to go... <laughs> you know, I'll be back. <laughs> Bathroom break. You know, uh, don't say anything. And then finally, you all in in this uh, and how to do this. Let's honor our leaders. They take bullets for us all the time that we don't even know about. So show gratitude and appreciation. You know, just try to encourage them along the way. You have no idea. There, I heard this this saying a couple years ago. Whenever you meet someone, everybody is always going through something. All of you in here, we're all going through, there's something right now that's maybe over here or maybe it's even right here in our minds that we're going through. Everybody's going through something. And so your leaders, you have no idea that they've made like 72 decisions since you walked in today. And just looking for ways to encourage them and help them do the best that they can do as the senior leader. Okay, so just a, a couple last thoughts and I'm going to close it up. Um, I get that this is different. I mean, it is. It's, it's unusual. It's like, Asa, this, this is state government. You know? Well, yeah, but it's where we work. It's where we spend the majority of our weeks. And how do we want to spend our time as we work with all these people and these professionals and as, as we grow as people as well into what we dream of being? But I do want to give you, just to encourage you, the hardest person that you'll ever lead is yourself. It is. Discipline. I mean, how many of you all, you know, uh, back on January 1st, exercise was on your list? Right? It was for me. And then how many of you, it's like, oh, was that on my list? <laughs> uh, these Rolos are really good. That's actually a true story because I have a bunch of Rolos on my desk right now. <laughs> you know, so you're the hardest person that you'll ever lead. So give yourself some grace to pra as you practice this. It takes time. Don't give up if you choose honor only to instantly get rejected or get dishonored. As if we all together begin to work on this and bring this into our, our workplace, it'll begin to take on. We'll begin to borrow courage from each other as we go first in honor and choosing to do this and bringing that culture change that makes work better. And everybody wins in that. It's, honor is contagious. It will spread if we persist. So finally, I just want to say that creating a culture of honor in the workplace will take time and effort, but together, we can change the culture of the workplace into one that is more honoring. Thank you.